so, so that's a good question. Like, how do people usually get into PM? I tried to get into PM. Did you know that? Yeah, I yeah, did. Yeah, I tried to get into RPM yeah. at Facebook or EPM at Google. Yep. I didn't get those roles. But then, if you don't get those roles, how do you get into? Yeah. It? So I think there's two. Yeah, there's, yeah. there's two ways that I think like people can get into product, right? Like one is like join a program where it's like there is no there's no prerequisite for how much experience you have. So like all the big companies have rotational programs right. and product. The problem is, is there's like because there's no prerequisites, there's 20,000 people applying for 10 slots, right? So it's like, it's like almost like harder to get into college, to get into these roles than it is to get into college. Before we continue this video, I just want to say thank you so much to Airtable for sponsoring this video. Airtable allows people and companies to create their own custom applications, regardless of their technical skills. Millions of people use Airtable to build their own custom software. Use cases ranges from product management to major video productions. So that means that Airtable can be an all-in-one platform for product managers. What would you make if you had the tools designed for the way you like to create? Airtable gives you the freedom and structure to design a workflow that fits your needs. Airtable can handle all kinds of content that you throw at it. Attachments, long text posts, checkboxes, and just so much more. With Airtable, you and your team can ideate, organize, and execute on your ambitious product vision, all in one place. Quickly glance at a high level progress on all your initiatives or drill down to any specific details and understand how to unblock your projects. Airtable is an all-in-one collaboration platform that keeps up with even the fastest growing product teams. Now, if you're interested, you can receive $50 of credit by signing up on airtable.com slash Joma. All right. Have you ever used Airtable before? I have. I actually, I, I, when I was working at Box, we actually worked with really? Airtable oh, wow. to build an integration. We had Howie, the CEO, mm -hmm. come in and talk at our Friday lunch. Yeah. Um, but in general, I was when the company was really small, mm -hmm. but now it's like been growing like crazy. Okay. All right. Welcome to the show, man. <laughs> it's been a while. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. All right, so I brought you in today because you're a product manager at Fang, right? <laughs> yeah. So why don't you just give me a short introduction of yourself? Yeah, so I'm Sanjay. Um, I've been about a PM for maybe four or so years. I studied, I grew up in the Park. I studied uh, management science and engineering at Stanford. Did a couple startups uh, during when I was interning. Um, so I did one at a company called Smule, which is a social music company, um, most famous for the IMT Pain app <laughs> on the phone. The first one to use the, the, the microphone nice. as mm -hmm. um, an instrument. Second, I worked at a company called like Reputation.com, which is more like a privacy type company. I did a little bit of kind of more data analytics type work. Um, in my junior year, I decided I wanted to see what investment banking was all about. Ooh. Um, and sold out for a little bit and did a summer of investment banking Morgan Stanley. Is that when you started um, following arbitrage, Andy? Yeah, maybe. Um, I definitely understand those jokes. Nice. But I just realized at that point it just wasn't necessarily mm. kind of right for me. Mm -hmm. um, it was a lot of like client service type work, so you're working on behalf of someone else instead of building your own things yourself. Mm -hmm. um, and based on my other jobs, I always realized that like becoming a, being a PM is all about like building things, and I wanted to get back. Mm -hmm. um, to building things and so that's kind of where I was and that was kind of the goal I wanted to get to is like how do I start building and how do I become a PM. So the first PM job would be where? Yeah, the first PM job I had was at Box. Was at Box, um, okay. But I didn't start as a PM. And then your second PM job is at? Facebook. Ah, okay, yep. okay, nice, nice. Who have you worked with at Facebook? <laughs> I've worked with Joma. Oh my God, really? <laughs> Joma was my data scientist. Awesome. At awesome. Facebook. He was... One to ten. He was alright. He was alright. Okay. He got stuff done. Mm -hmm. I like work with him. You can, you can say the truth. I'll just edit all the bad stuff. Okay, so I'm just going to stick to the script this time. Because a lot of people tell me that I talk too much during these <laughs> interviews. <laughs> and they're like, shut the fuck up, Joma. I'm going to stick to the script. Alright. Okay. So what does it feel? like to be Silicon Valley's most eligible bachelor. <laughs> you, you're speaking those words, not me. No, it's true. You know, <laughs> all my viewers are like, oh my god. <laughs> yeah. All right, let's get to the real PM stuff. So, yeah, so you told me that you did I, IB, investment mm -hmm. banking, and then you switched to 
PM right yeah. now, right? And before IB, you were kind of like a data analyst. Yeah, I did a ton of things. It was mostly I worked at tech mm-hmm. startups. So was Box the first full-time job you started at? Oh, uh, yes, yeah. Okay, so you were a data analyst? Yeah, so I actually did a lot of stuff, but mm-hmm. I did a lot of different things at Box. I joined a team that was like a startup within Box. Mm-hmm. I did a, like, I did developer marketing, I did partnerships, I did analytics, I did comms as a uh-huh. subject because it was a small team, everyone had to kind of work on everything. From Box? Yeah. Box is a small company? No, but the team within Box was helping build out our developer platform. I see. And so it was like probably five or six people within that, or is our own business unit. So Interesting. I ended up doing kind of all the ranges of work, uh-huh. just based on what we needed, yeah. um, but wasn't, and I did product stuff, but I wasn't a product manager at that point. Okay. But at the end, you were a product manager. But then but what I did was, I knew I wanted to do it, but mm-hmm. I guess a PM is in general, it's like there aren't that many roles, especially for people that are coming without PM experience. Yeah, so so that's a good question. Like, how do people usually get into PM? I tried to get into PM. Did you know that? Yeah, I yeah, did. Yeah, I tried to get into RPM yeah. at Facebook or EPM at Google. Yeah. I didn't get those roles. But then, if you don't get those roles, how do you get into PM? Yeah, so I think there's two, yeah, there's, yeah. So there's two ways that I think like, people can get into product, right? Like one is like join a program where it's like, there is no, there's no prerequisite for how much experience you have. So like all the big companies have rotational programs right. and product. The problem is, is there's like, because there's no prerequisites, there's 20,000 people applying for 10 slots, right? So it's like, it's like almost like harder to get into the college that, to get into these roles than it is to get into college. Do you know the numbers for RPM, APM acceptance? Uh, no, but I think, I think just in terms of sheer numbers, like I would imagine like, how many does Facebook hire? I think it's around like 14, 14, 14 to 20 maybe per every year. year or per quarter. Uh, I think it's almost per year. Maybe it increased more, but when I first started, it was like 14 per year. Damn, that's crazy. And so if you think about it, it's like, it's re- it, like just the numbers aren't in your favor to start. The way that like a lot of t- people have done it and the way that I tell people that they want to get into product is like, there's two other pathways. One is like you work at a company in another role and then build up your kind of background, build up your reputation of the company, and then transition it, transition laterally in the company to product if there's an opening. Just because everyone knows you're a known quantity, people know if you're doing well, like they're more likely to, to find a product role. And the second one is like, you can probably try to find a really small startup and start to just do other things, including product. Um, but I would say the, the easiest way, but also it's not the most direct way, is to do it within a company to transition. Mm-hmm. Into a product role, right? Um, and then once you are once you are like a in the product role, it becomes it opens up a lot of pathways because you have some experience as a product manager. So before becoming a PM, what are the best jobs to transition into PM? And this is not me knocking any of like the the rotational programs, but if you start as a PM right out of college, like it's great you become a really good PM, but you're really focused on doing something the first way you learned it, mm-hmm. right? And so if like you work at Google, you work at Facebook, like you learn to do a PM's job that way, and that's what your role what you think of PM or what you think of other functions. And you can be a good PM, but I think to become like a really great PM, which I think I'm still working to, to work towards, is it's almost like it's it's definitely more, I would encourage people to go work in other functions that are that help support product anyways. Like it could be analytics, it could be marketing, it could be communication, it could be sales, right? And you build empathy around like how you should, other people work with products. So when you become a product manager, you understand how all these other functions tie together mm-hmm. to become like a really, really good product manager that sees the whole like picture, mm-hmm. right? Instead of just a narrow mm-hmm. piece of building product. Right. But I think like in general, there is no real like- Like stepping stone. I don't think right there right? really is. I think like it I mean, depends on the skills that you want. It depends, one depends on the company. Right, right, right. But it depend, also depends on the skills mm-hmm. that you want to develop as a PM, because there's so many different types that's of PMs. True. That's true. Like, one PM can, t- can totally have a different skill set than another. Yeah, like one, if you want to be a super technical PM, mm-hmm. like, yeah, it might be really helpful to have it. Sweet. sweet. You might, yeah, you might have, if you're a software engineer, mm-hmm. you work in data, like, mm-hmm. it'd be really helpful to get really nitty gritty with technical details. But if you're doing something that's more, like, consumer facing or a little bit abstracted away, like, having communicate good communication skills and being able to problem solve and think deeply about a problem is like even more important. So if you, it doesn't matter where, like what job you had before. Um, I think the one thing to note is like, you don't, like I have taken computer science classes, like I understand like how to code, but by no means I'm technical. And so like some of the best PMs that I know are have no technical backgrounds. Wow. And they just learn and they're curious about like diving deep and understanding a problem that like it doesn't matter if they don't have technical skills. Right. Okay, but if you had to choose like one job that is the easiest to transition into PM, let's say at Facebook. Yeah. Because since you're you're there for a while, like which job do you see most often? In general, let's see. I mean software engineers you see that there are three types of I think you can have your software engineers to um, PM. 
yeah, there's some software engineers that turn to PMs if they don't if if they want to start like building things and managing people. I don't think it's a it's super common. I think data people who are data in data um, data analytics, data science, like have an inherent grasp of like data and how it's used to make prior decisions. So I think it's in there you see a lot of people that transition. I twin I have a twin brother that's also a PM. Wait, what did uh, you do before PM? He was in analytics, so he was like a data scientist. Okay, okay. Um, and for them, it's easy because you can see the data trends, so you're at least you know how to dig apart and form hypotheses. Mm -hmm. The other one is I think even if you're in product marketing, right? Like you're so close to oh, the yeah. product that like you understand customer needs. So mm -hmm. you, if you really have, have empathized empathy with the customer or their user, like it's much easier to become a PM because you already have that understanding. That's true. Well, because it's so hard to kind of um, rate different PMs because you're saying like every PM does really different things. Yep. So what makes a good PM versus a great PM, like you said? Before? Yeah, I think a good PM is someone that can just execute well on like mm -hmm. a vision, right? Like you have a roadmap, you execute, you unblock, um, and you just march towards like your mm -hmm. goal. I think a great PM does a couple things. I think one can help like really strategize around what is the next thing that's coming. So think ahead of the box. So like if you plan in like six months, like you're working towards that six month good line, but you're also understanding like in the next six months, what do we need to build? And so you're always thinking ahead of how these products can uh, can scale further. Mm -hmm. I think the second thing is around like just communication. I think if you can communicate and set context across different context settings across like all the different functions, like engineering, product, marketing, privacy, right? Like I think it makes a life, your life really easy to unblock your mm -hmm. team um, and getting under people buy in to understand why you're doing something. Mm -hmm. um, but I think the last thing, it always really helps to be really fluid in data and understand like, mm -hmm. not necessarily writing your own queries, it's great to write your own queries if you can, but... Um, <laughs> I didn't do anything when yeah, I had you I, I did it great. myself. It was great. But like, just understanding the fluidity of data. So you see something go up, you have to understand why it goes up. And being able to break apart like, and understand exactly why the, what the lovers are mm -hmm. makes you just really develop good product intuition to understand mm -hmm. like, this is why these things are happening instead of like, ah, oh, it's just luck. And then it can help reinforce mm -hmm. what you want to do later. So even as a good PM, you know, you say they have to execute well, yeah. but it's it's kind of hard to, you know, at least for some people, to grasp. Well, what does it actually mean to execute like day yeah. to day, right? Like what, like why is it hard to execute? You just ask someone to do something, ask someone to do yeah. something. It's, it's easy, right? Or is it? No, it's actually. I mean, you would assume it's easy. <laughs> yeah. But as you're working, you're not working. You're working with different functions. So you're working with design. You're working with engineering. You're working with data. You're working with research. And each, for each project that you have, potentially, you might have different asks for each of them, right? Mm -hmm. And so for maybe your scope, you're starting out a project, you need research and design to start like lead the way before you can help scope out something on the engineering side. Mm -hmm. And so it's getting the timelines in lane to like understand what the sequencing of every project is to make sure everyone's hitting their deadlines. Mm -hmm. And so it's making sure different teams work together so that each team has what they need mm -hmm. in order to go build the product. And then once people are building, it's like there's always these roadblocks that come up and then it's how do you unblock that team. If it's working with another team, it's like how do you get that team mm -hmm. to do what you want and unblocking your team so they can continue to execute. Right. So like it's a lot of like people management skills, but also just like a lot of like yeah. trying to influence um, to get things done. Mm -hmm. Yeah, get shit done. So as a great product manager yep. like you are, are there any like anecdotes or actually like, concrete things, like tips that you can give to product manager on how to influence people or how to uh, align people yep. to better. Uh, yeah, I think, the big, I think the bigger thing is like, it's how do you set shared goals? It's like, if you have your team that's working on one thing and another team that's working on another thing, like if those goals are not aligned, like people are not gonna work together. Mm -hmm. And so it's framing a problem saying like, this is the goal we're trying to do, this is how it helps you, this is how what you're doing helps us. Mm -hmm. Make sure that like everyone's like aligned and incentivized to work on the same thing. Mm -hmm. When those things don't work, then like you always have this fight of trying to like escalate it and say, oh, this this like this team's not doing what we want them to do, and it becomes contentious. Uh, I see. And so I think it's more about like, how do you operate a good working model, get people bought into like mm -hmm. what the success is, and say it up front what the success is mm -hmm. to make sure, and then align like commitments mm -hmm. to get people to actually like do things on time because everything requires a lot of work mm -hmm. across different teams. Mm -hmm. Kind of a niche question, but. What do you think matters more? Uh, relationships with these different teams mm -hmm. to make them do stuff? Or incentives? Uh, I think they go with the hand in hand. And I think that like, you can't say one or the other. I think mm -hmm. incentivizing a team and through like the right shared goals builds helps build your relationship. Oh, that's true. Because um, um, I mean, when I was a data scientist, 
I did a lot of favors to PMs that I like more. Yeah. That's it. You know, right? yeah. you know, like, so it's not necessarily incentives. I feel like, I don't know if incentives work as well on me than like relationship. I'm sure it's different for everyone. But if you were to say, but if you were to say like, <laughs> I can help you hit your goal quicker. Mm-hmm. Like and, and it's, yeah, exactly. Or say, not even personal, but your team, right? Like mm-hmm. saying like, okay, we can get to this point 20% quicker if we work together, like that's incentive. Mm-hmm. The other one is our relationships are important because once you build that trust, like, mm-hmm. People are willing to like then spend time because they know that it's worth it. So you get both. How much do you make as a PM? How many hours do you work? <laughs> do you work for a whole a lot? How much do you... <laughs> YouTube questions, man. Huh? Um, it varies. It varies. It varies. Okay. Um, I think the one thing good thing about being a PM is that you can <laughs> good good dodge. <laughs> yeah. Hey, the one good thing is like you can you can make your own like you can work on things the way you want to work on it. Right? There's no like I need to chip this thing by this or there might be an de- artificial deadline that's in place that you work towards but it's essentially how you sequence that work and so there's no like routine day and some days it's like we have a deadline to hit we work really hard and other days it's more of like okay we're just scoping out things like we have time and you can kind of relax mm-hmm. and so i think it depends on the just the project itself but it's also nice because like for other roles like if you go to banking right like mm-hmm. you have a client that needs something before you even start on it and so you're working hard nonstop and they keep coming in, whereas a PM, you're managing your own team, and so you can manage those deadlines and those timelines, so it's much easier. I'm sorry, I didn't, I couldn't, I couldn't get the money question. <laughs> <laughs> give, me a, give me a range so that they, there's no, 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 it depends. Not your range, it's just, just like, a, like an L5 range or L4. I would say it's less than a, I'm probably less than a typical <laughs> software engineer. Okay. Um, oh, but okay. oh yeah, actually that's good. I said less than a software engineer, but it's yeah. but it's com- it's actually it's comparable to software. Mm-hmm. Did you think it was very different your role as a product manager in Box versus Facebook? Yes, like, like it, night why was it vastly different? different? I mean, two things. I think one, it's like working in an enterprise company versus a consumer company. Oh, right, right. An enterprise company, things are dictated more around like your customers that you're selling to, so it's much it's much more clear about the things you need to build, it's more about prioritization of it and how long it takes to build mm-hmm. um, and like what the cost is, right? Because you only have a handful of clients. Yeah, or if you have 70, like a box, you have like 75,000 custom paying customers. That's a lot. <laughs> but it's like at that point, it's like in enterprise, it's pretty well known what the problems are. Oh yeah, they're, they're pretty vocal because they're paying. And they're paying you. So and the goal is like, how do you unlock, can mm-hmm. you sell this deal? So it's much easier to say like, here's mm-hmm. like here's the top things that we need to do is to, to close this deal. And you figure out across all your customers like what you do and you just execute and build. It's tough because it's, it's a little bit more technical type problems. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's a lot more like, there's a lot more stakeholders in it. So how is the interview process like for At- PMs? I think the interview process is, it can go a couple ways. I think one, at a company that's like big, like Facebook or Google and those, and you, gen- and you are interviewing for like a general role, right? Like you're not interviewing for a specific team, it's pretty structured. It's like, you, how well can you break down a product, a really ambiguous product problem? Like for example, how do you build a better camera, right? Mm-hmm. Like it's just, that's, that's what would be like the prompt and you have to understand like how to break it down and put a framework in place. Cool. The second one is how well you use data. It's like, okay, this number is dropping, like how would you debug it or how would you set a goal? Mm -hmm. Actually, before we go into data, can we just make it more concrete? Maybe we can make an example. So how do you create a better camera? So how would you answer that if you really had to Yeah, I think the question is, is like, I mean, the way the structure you usually would take Uh would be like, what is, like you would start out like, oh, what is the goal of the whole thing, right? Mm -hmm. Like, what's the goal of a camera? Like, what's, what are you trying to accomplish? And then it's like potentially like setting like a metric, like what a success for this mm-hmm. camera look like? Is it selling more? Mm-hmm. Is it getting people to use more features, mm-hmm. right? Like, mm-hmm. um, and then I think it's totally all about like understanding who the users are. Right, right. Um, who are the users and what are their needs? Okay. And what are they looking for? Is it like, if it's just like a basic point and shoot to capture memories, like people don't care about quality. They care about just the ease and quickness mm-hmm. of like taking a photo. Right. Someone cares about like, ridiculous quality it's like okay maybe it's something that's a very different right mm-hmm. and then it's understanding like what are the features that help address those needs mm-hmm. so, like what are the things that you would build and then it's all about understanding at that point like prioritization like if you have a finite set of resources how would you prioritize something mm-hmm. um, it's more of like how do you structure break down that point mm-hmm. rather than what the question or the problem mm-hmm. is yeah that's nice i feel like structure is really important in these interviews for example when when you asked me like oh how do you make a camera better 
Mm-hmm. But then you start breaking down like, but for what? You know, is it for yeah. professionals or for, yep. is it for uh, like which which audience? Because the problem that people have all the time is they jump straight to the solution. It's like, oh, right. the camera, like uh, the lens, or uh-huh. it must be the quality. Uh-huh. But there's no way to say like, why are you actually right. doing it? Mm-hmm. Like you have to really know who your target audience is. Exactly. Cool. And then make sure in the interview you really ask more questions, right? Yeah. You have to ask a lot of questions. Exactly. It's like a conversation. Exactly. Cool. cool. Awesome. Okay. And then the data side, yeah. The data side is more like, okay, you see numbers going down, like, why? Mm. Or it's like, oh, you're setting a goal for your team. How would you set that goal? Mm -hmm. And it's, again, like, how do you Mm -hmm. put structure in place in order to, Mm -hmm. like, answer that question? Because you could have a ton of different goals, right? Like, if you're just a new product, like, you might say it's all about user growth. If it's a more engaged, if it's more mature project, it's all about, like, deepening engagement. Um, and so there's like very different ways you can take it, but it's all about putting a structure in place to say what the goal is nice, um, or what success is. And then there's the other side, the other interviews that are outside mm. of these structured ones around like, okay, maybe you're getting hired for to be the first PM on a team or hiring to a specific role. And at that point, it's like, it's a couple of things, like how well you can still do break down ambiguous problems, like potentially how well you can deal with data, but also like, do these people want to work with you? And do you have the right experience to be like, to add value to their team. And so it's a little bit more fungible to say like, okay, maybe he's a little weaker on these places, but like we would think we would work really well with him or we think his perspective is really good. And so it just depends, I guess, company to company and role to role. How important is domain expertise usually for experienced PMs? I think it depends on the company. Like a company, like a big company, you can kind of find any role. And so it's a little bit more generalized, but for like a team that has one head count for one PM, at, for the rest of the year, it's like it's about how do you make the right decision, and having domain expertise really, really does help, or really strong product intuition mm-hmm. around like that specific space. Um, so it definitely does help. Do you think you might get pigeonholed though if it's always about domain expertise? Yeah, and you see that a lot. You see like mm-hmm. some people who work in enterprise, right? Like mm-hmm. they stuck on they don't they're not stuck, but they built their expertise around like building developer platforms, and that's just what they keep doing. Um, but I think it is easy to escape and try something oh, different. Okay. I think it's just sometimes easier to keep working in a role that you've worked in because mm-hmm. you know that understand the problem really well. Do you think you want to escape your domain or do you think you want to continue in that domain? Whatever I don't know. I, I actually don't know. Mm-hmm. I think it depends. I think mm-hmm. I work in media and I think media is super interesting. Mm-hmm. It's also really challenging. Mm-hmm. I think having from enterprise, it's like it's a little bit more cut and dry in terms of the things that you like the things that you should build Um, and so it's just it depends on like what type of environment you want i think in consumer it's a lot about like luck as well because it's hard to understand what people want Mm -hmm. Um, and so it's challenging if you you have to just be patient 